So, good morning and welcome to our last seminar in the current semester of Geopolitical Tuesday. I would like to thank especially our very special guest, uh, Pauline Delage from the French National Center for Scientific Research in Paris for accepting our invitation. I'm very happy to welcome you to her lecture entitled Before Me Too, 40 Years of Institutional and Militant Struggles Against Gender-Based Violence. For our audience on the Zoom, please turn off your microphones and cameras. And for your information, this conference is recorded and will be available on the YouTube channel. My name is Kinga Torbicka. I am the research fellow at the French Center of Culture and Francophone Studies at the University of Warsaw. At the beginning, I will present our guest, then her lecture will start. And afterwards, we invite you to question and answer session. And you could write your questions or comments on the chat. So, let me present our guest. Pauline Delage is a sociologist at the French National Center for Scientific Research, researcher attached to Centre de Recherche Sociologique et Politique de Paris, Culture et Société Urbaine. Her work focuses on the transformations of feminist movements and public action against gender-based violence. In addition to numerous articles, she recently co-edited the book, Gender-Based Violence After Me Too in 2022 with her colleagues, Catherine Cavallin, Gersio de Silva, Irene, Despontin, Bibia Pavard, and Delphine Lacan. He, she also published Feminism in the World, 23 Stories of a Planetary Revolution, Women's Strides, Everything Can Disappear, and Domestic Violence from Feminist Struggle to the Public Cause. So now let me uh, invite you to her lecture and tired before me to 40 years of institutional and militant struggles against gender-based violence. So Pauline, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kinga, for inviting me. Um, I have to say I'm really sorry because my English is a little rusty, so I will try to be as clear as possible, but if, well, I'm not clear or my French accent is too Thanks. strong, uh, please tell me. So in the wake of the Weinstein scandal, when this powerful Hollywood producer was accused of sexual abuse by dozens of women, actress Elisa Milano sent a tweet saying, if you've been sexually harassed or assaulted, write me too as a reply to this tweet. Milano's message sparked a watershed of tweets and retweets worldwide and launched what came to be known as the Me Too movement. However, this unprecedented movement had various precedents. First of all, in 2006, Tarana Burke, an African-American social worker engaged in activism against sexual assault, started another Me Too movement to call women who had experienced sexual abuse to get together. But also in the, in the uh, sorry, 2010s, uh, feminist mobilizations worldwide arose to call for justice and the end of violence against women. For instance, in 2011, Egyptian women who were involved against authoritarianism in Tahrir Square denounced sexual violence committed both by the military and by other male activists. Most famously in Argentina in, in 2015, the movement Ni Una Menos is an excellent example of a widespread and long lasting movement against violence against women. It became a symbol that spread 
throughout Latin America and the world. These are just a few instances of how violence against women became a key issue, not only in the social world and in the feminist movements, but also a critical case that came to symbolize a new wave in the history of the feminist movements. Although it is criticized, the wave metaphor is used to describe different periods of the feminist movement, different historical periods of the feminist movement. The first wave was dedicated to civil rights for women. The second wave revolved around the model, the personal is political and focused on intimate and body issues. It is in this context, specifically, specifically during consciousness raising groups that women gathered to share about the division of labor, sexuality, and also abuse that they either experienced or witnessed. The third wave questioned the idea of a universal experience for all women. It focused on social, racial, and sexual relations of power that shaped feminism. And the fourth wave, fourth wave and we're supposed to be in it right now, so this fourth wave is characterized by the focus on gender-based violence. For these reasons, historians in, in France, um, Michel Zancarini Fournel, Florence Rochefort and Bibia Pavard, so these historians thought of the Me Too movement as the Me Too moment. That is a wider historical period when gender-based violence is a central action topic online and offline in various countries worldwide. So in this presentation, I will focus on the French case to trace the historical premises of the Me Too moment we are experiencing right now. To do so, I will look at the development of feminist organizations dedicated to violence against women and, and to domestic violence in particular. Then I will show how violence against women has been institutionalized. And to conclude, I will try and highlight what the Me Too movement changed. So first of all, um, about uh, the feminist organizations. As I said, in the 1970s, the leading feminist model was the personal is political. It is thanks to this political and cognitive frame that feminist activists discovered, so to speak, sexual and domestic violence and framed it as a public issue. They set up consciousness raising groups, which helped women to realize how gender oppression shaped their daily lives and sometimes how their lives were affected by violence. In 1970, a special issue of a journal called Partisan, and this special issue was called was entitled Liberation des Femmes Année Zero. So in this in, in this article, Emmanuel described how law students had raped her. This is one of the very first feminist testimonies of rape, which shed light on the dynamics of violence, sexual abuse, and rape are not limited to the lower classes or people with mental health issues because they are the symptoms of gender domin domination. As patriarchy is everywhere, violence against women also is. So that's the general framework that they built at the time. Similarly, Annie Sujet, who was a significant figure of the feminist movement at the time, wrote that when she was a kid, she knew of domestic violence because it was everywhere. Still, domestic violence was always related to alcohol, poverty, mental health problems, etc. So what feminist activists did was to, re to reveal how widespread violence against women was, how it impacted women's lives, and that the root of this violence was male domination. Although the phenomenon was widespread, law enforcement, social work agencies, and the judicial system were silent about violence against women. Not only were they silent, but these 
institution were also complacent with abusers and blamed victims. Feminist activists thus denounced that public institutions failed to tackle violence. And in the late 1970s, feminist activists started to build nonprofit organizations to fill the lack of services dedicated to survivors and their children. One major reference circulated and, and encouraged, sorry, activists to build specific structures for survivors. In the early 1970s, Erin Pitsy set up Women's Aid in Cheswick nearby London. And Women's Aid was a shelter dedicated to, to survivors. In 1974, she published a book called Scream Quietly or the Neighbors Will Hear. And this book was translated into French and published one year later in 1975. So this was how women's aid served as an example of a way of dealing with domestic violence and of dealing with survivors, of supporting survivors. The idea of building shelters and opening hotlines spread. And one of the very first feminist shelters in France, in France was set up in 1978. Feminist nonprofit organizations dedicated to domestic violence later got together and created the Fédération Nationale Solidarité Femme in the late 1980s. Similar services sprang up throughout the country to deal with domestic violence, such as shelters, with, um, to deal also with um, sexual abuse, such as the Collective Féministe Contre le Viol, so, uh, that is um, the feminist collective against uh, rape, and uh, this uh, collective developed around a, a helpline or to deal with sexual harassment of work. And um, another uh, nonprofit organization called AVFT um, arose to, to deal with sexual harassment of work. Um, so the, the, these organizations developed a feminist practice and I'm going to um, explore this idea now. These services for survivors still exist today. They are consequences of some of the harvest of the 1970s feminist movements. As sociologist Patricia Yancy Martin put it, feminist organizations have been doing the work of the movement, and I quote, not only have they provided services for victims, but they have also called for legal and policy changes. They have been institutionalized by using some welfare state tools, such as state funding, for instance, and by employing social workers and psychologists. But feminist ideas still shape service provision in these nonprofit organizations. To do so, Feminist has reshaped social work practices and helped to develop a specific approach that focuses on women's needs. This practice is based on listening and believing survivors. It is also based on validating what they say, what they feel and their choices. For instance, when a survivor doesn't want to report to the police, no one is supposed to tell her to do so. Social workers would never say to a woman that she has to leave her partner, an abusive partner. And they consider what they call the phenomenon of aller-retour, or to, to translate it into English to go back and forth, that is when a survivor needs to return to her abuser, who is also her partner after leaving him. So they, they consider this phenomenon uh, when they approach domestic violence. Um, these feminist workers also rely on concepts and ideas drawn from psychology and sociology to explain domestic violence and its impacts on survivors. For instance, they use the concept of the cycle of violence which was developed by Lena Walker, who was a psychologist, an American psychologist. And this uh, concept of cycle of violence describes 
domestic violence as a cycle with different faces to explain why survivors don't leave an abusive partner. They also use the concept of a continuum of violence, which was designed by the British sociologist Liz Kelly. Uh, and this concept serves as a general framework to understand the role, of, uh, the role that violence has in, in women's lives. So um, these family nonprofit organizations um, were built around the feminist practice and they use some of the social work tools, but also feminist ideas uh, to support survivors and uh, to provide services for survivors. But and I'm going to, to go to my second part. Um, they also have called uh, for state intervention. Aside from the feminist nonprofit uh, nonprofit organization, the state has become involved in dealing with violence against women in France. So, first of all, violence against women policy gained more legitimacy in the 1990s thanks to, among other factors, the in in the national context, and more specifically, in national conferences as well as global reports and text. To take a few examples, in 1993, the Vienna Declaration on Human Rights defined violence against women as an expression of unequal power. Um, in 1995, the Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing urged various states, including France, to promote actions against gender-based violence. The issue of violence against women also gained importance at the European level in the late 1990s. In 1999, the Council of Europe called for zero tolerance and developed research programs against uh, violence. The, uh, 2011 Istanbul Convention also insisted on the necessary commitment of actors from different sectors in the fight against violence against women. So feminist organizations continued to lobby the government and politicians. They called for legal changes to improve the protections of the protection of victims and condemn abusers, but also to set up programs of action and prevention. In France, the very first policies were implemented in the late 1980s when the government created commissions dedicated to violence against women and they launched, uh, and, and the government launched the first national campaign in 1989. But state intervention have, has mainly developed uh, since 2000. Three-year plans have been implemented since 2004. Laws were voted to evict uh, abusive partners, to create protect protective orders and visas for undocumented survivors, but also cr to criminalize marital rape and marital theft, as well as psychological abuse. Along with the institutionalization of domestic violence um, and violence against women in more general, uh, in general, research on the topic has also developed. So just to, to let you know that there was no data available in France until the early 2000s, uh, when a first survey was on violence against women, which was entitled Enquête sur les violences envers les femmes en France, was conducted nationwide. Data has started to be published every year on femicides. And a second survey about gender-based violence was conducted in 2015 and published in 2021. So now various pieces of research, including um, um, PhD dissertations are being published, both on the public issue of violence against women, but also on the psychosocial dynamics underlying violence. Although the feminist cause has been institutionalized, the movement has not become co-opted or depoliticized. 
However, activism in these nonprofit organizations has changed. It is now more focused on violence against women and domestic violence and probably less focused on gender inequalities in general. Moreover, uh, feminist nonprofit organizations have promoted a logic of reform of institutions and of conviction of actors rather than uh, contesting public institutions and actors' behaviors. On a daily basis, though, uh, feminist nonprofit organizations do what we may call a specialized political work. On a local level, nonprofit organizations aim at converting others like law enforcement, social workers, etc., to the feminist perspective. They do what Patricia uh, Yancey Martin, uh, I, I, I talked about her earlier, calls discursive politics, as they try to transform, to change how others see domestic violence and deal with domestic violence. Within this nonprofit, uh, feminist nonprofits, in service training programs are used to convey some of the ideas of a feminist framing of violence against women. They pass on the idea that women must be believed, that violence is widespread, and that the problem is based on gender asymmetry, that is, that women are the primary victims. Uh, with a colleague, uh, Gwenael Perrier, uh, I wrote an article that was published in a journal entitled French Politics. And in this article, we show that training programs help to empower workers by providing them with cognitive and practical tools to treat domestic violence and survivors better and to create a shared culture on domestic violence and professional networks. So training programs are often neither conceived as a channel for politicizing other workers and policy actors, nor promoted to raise consciousness about gender relationships and their impacts on women's lives. Instructors that we, interviews, uh, we interviewed, sorry, often present these training programs as practice oriented and focused on violence against women. For instance, when sexism is explained, it aims at better understanding the mechanisms of violence. So that's why uh, I said that they do a specialized political work because the, the, the political work that they do is focused on violence against women and it's practice oriented. Regarding um, their relationship to the feminist identity, uh, the, the relationship to feminist identity differs according to the context. So it's different in each country. For instance, in the USA or in Switzerland, feminist identity is not displayed or even hidden. Uh, it may be hidden. And it may be, it also may be different from one feminist nonprofit organization to another. In France, nonprofit work uh, workers often identify as feminists. Some of them work in these structures because they want to reconcile political commitment with work. Others are politicized through work. Some say that they are daily feminists and that they wouldn't participate in marches or be part of a feminist collective, but that their work is feminist. So they do identify as feminists, but it's, it's also um, limited to their work or it's, it's specialized in a way. On an organizational level, nonprofit organizations participates, uh, participate in demonstrations against violence uh, against women in France. And they uh, fuel a feminist culture in a way, but they do so in a heterogeneous way according to the structures the feminist framing of violence is also asserted, yet this feminist framing changed. 
the issue of violence against uh, women and, and domestic violence in particular have been shaped and reshaped by definitional struggles, which often revolve around the issue of male survivors and if or whether or not nonprofit organizations support them in their premises. So in this organization, the, the organization that, that I studied, uh, gender asymmetry is asserted. It is embodied in the answer to the recurring question, what about men? Uh, do you actually support men in, in, in your organization? Uh, do you think that men can be victims of domestic violence? When they are confronted to this question, nonprofit workers recognize the existence of male survivors, but they explicitly state that feminist nonprofits mainly deal with women and that women are the main survivors of domestic violence, the primary survivors of domestic violence. So feminist organizations focus on uh, violence against women and female survivors, but tend to disconnect them from the broader issue of gender inequalities. So as I said, um, the public issue of violence against women has been uh, institutionalized, laws were voted um, and measures were, were actually taken by, by the state to deal with domestic violence and violence against women. And there have been uh, many, many structures uh, like shelters and hotlines uh, that have been built um, in, in after the feminist movement to deal with domestic violence and survivors. So what does Me Too change in that context? First of all, um, one could say that Me Too has helped to renew feminist protest mobilizations in different countries and specifically or particularly in France. There are several examples of feminist collectives, marches, and events that sprang up after Me Too. For instance, in France, uh, there's been this um, collective called Nous Toutes, uh, which launched um, a march uh, in November against violence against women. But uh, there have been also feminist collage uh, that sprang up throughout France. Moreover, hashtags and um, dedicated to violence and to Me Too multiplied according to sectors and types of violence to make abuse and violence and types of survivors visible in different social worlds. So for instance, um, the hashtag Me Too Gay uh, sprang up to take into account LGBTQ uh, violence. Aside from um, the renewal of feminist protest mobilizations uh, that, is, um, that illustrates the fourth wave feminism, um, the Me Too moment has sparked normative changes in different sectors. For instance, in the media, and um, I rely on the book that Kinga mentioned, so the book about uh, Me Too, that I published with some of my colleagues, Catherine Cavalin, Jair Ciudad Silva, Irene Despontes Lefebvre, Delphine Lacombe, and Bibia Pavard. Um, this, is, um, this book is actually a collection of articles about different sectors where Me Too have or haven't, haven't changed um, um, the way violence is perceived and dealt with. And um, the media is a very good a very good example of how Me Too have initiated a uh, sparked normative change. Um, so one of the article about uh, the media shows that uh, changes started with the DSK scandal, so the, the scandal about uh, Dominique Strauss-Kahn, uh, and another scandal, the Bhopal scandal. And after these two scandals, so the number of articles about violence against women uh, and sexual violence in particular um, tended, to tended to increase. So more articles are being published on the issue. And these articles are also different from what they used to be. They are longer 
and they are published in more legitimate sections of newspapers, like in the section Société or Society. But journalists also often use a more appropriate vocabulary. For instance, journalists tend to get rid of notions like crime passionnel, and they use femicide or feminicide instead. They also write about rape culture, for instance. So other articles of, the, of this book that I mentioned show that legal change accelerated with Me Too, that new devices against violence against women were created and new language was used. Um, for instance, in an article wrote by um, Chloe Moore and, and Linda Sealy, uh, they show that watchdog, watchdog cells at university or guide on sexual and sexist violence at the university were created, for instance. Uh, several articles also show that um, there were different collectives against violence that sprang up on campuses, for instance, but also in other work sectors. And, and uh, this article that I mentioned uh, that was uh, written by uh, Chloe Moore and Linda Seili uh, focus on the Ministry of Finance and uh, the Ministry of, of Higher Education. But there are still remaining problems. And one of the major main remaining problem is uh, related to the implementation of laws and measures against violence against women. So as I said, there are more devices or devices are more uh, extended, but their implementation continue to rely on the goodwill of committed actors in different sectors. Actors who want to uh, promote measures against violence against women also face funding issue and overwork problems. And a good example of this is the, the judiciary where lawyers actually have uh, funding issues to implement a measure against violence against women. There are also diverse forms of resistances to dealing with violence against women. Some actors remain reluctant to implement measures, especially um, when these measures are sanctions against abusers. But there are also actors who are ignorant of Me Too and sometimes openly hostile to Me Too. So to conclude, um, this presentation aimed at showing how the issue of violence against women emerged and has changed thanks to its institutionalization and the institutionalization of feminist nonprofit organizations. The middle moment illustrate a renewal of feminisms and accelerated its institutionalization, the institution, institutionalization of violence against women. But it, probably didn't radically change how, how violence against women and domestic violence are considered by social and institutional actors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pauline Delage, for your very, very interesting intervention uh, um, about very actual uh, problem. So now we invite you to ask questions or comments you could raise your hands or maybe write your comments or questions on the chat so uh, i see anata Krzywożeka. yes okay please hello thank our you our colleague uh, from university of warsaw anata Krzywożeka jelinowska Thank you for this uh, tremendous and very touch, touches uh, yeah, presentation. I'm just wondering, in, in your opinion, your personal subjective opinion, uh, is this action Me Too had influence on uh, police, social services? They are more aware about uh, reporting of crimes against women? Um, thank you for your question. Um, I don't know, well, 
in my, I have no opinion about the issue, but I know that uh, after Me Too, there were new guidelines and trainings for law enforcement workers and social actors. So they have to, <laughs> in a way, they have to take into account and consider violence more than what they used to. Um, it's probably a little early to say whether or not this is efficient, or, or, but but at least they have to take take this issue into account. So, uh, in two thousand and nineteen, um, new guidelines uh, were implemented to um, 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 for for law enforcement agencies to. Uh, uh, question survivors and to have an appropriate attitude when survivors come to law enforcement to report abuse. Um, so they have to take this into account at least. But there are still remaining problems and hostility is still remaining problem, yeah. Uh, hostility doesn't mean where this towards, hostility is Sorry, towards um, towards survivors and victim blaming still exists. Mm -hmm. I would mm -hmm. say, yeah. Mm -hmm. You said about trainings, um, programs, uh, trainings in France. Is they cooperate with the I don't know Spanish police, Portugal? If there are some inter um, uh, country um, work cooperation. Or is just only based in France because of the cultural um, context? Yeah. Context, yeah. Um, um, my 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 study was focused on France, so this, this is why I'm very French focused today. Um, I know of a program, a research program about um, a European research program about training, law enforcement training in Europe. Uh, so I, I would assume that at least there was some kind of cooperation in, in academia to, to, to study uh, how law enforcement deal with violence, sexual abuse and domestic violence. And sometimes there are some reference, um, you know, some models, European models that circulate and I know that uh, the Spanish case is one of them, but I, I'm, I'm not sure that at a street level, the street le whether the street level bureaucrats do use this reference. I don't think so. I don't know. Thank you. Głos, Kinia, nie słychacie? Ingo, głos? Yes, yes, sorry, sorry for that. <laughs> So, is uh, there is some uh, other questions or comments? Uh, as uh, Pauline, uh, Pauline Delange uh, mentioned about uh, different uh, sort of violence against women, I have one question. Um, are we talking about always the same thing when we talk about violence against women? sexist violence or gender-based violence? Um, what do you mean? Are we talking about the same violence? Do you mean a, a difference in nature of violence? Yes, or? Uh, yes, uh, yes exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, you're right. Uh, when the violence against women or, or gender-based violence are, you know, broad categories. So they actually encompass different kinds of violence, different, um, different, yeah, um, different actions that are perceived as violence. So they are different as they are physical violence, um, uh, sexual violence, or psych psychological violence. And this is actually the purpose of um, the concept that I mentioned: the concept of continuum of violence. That is to show that there are different kinds of violence, of abuse, that actually make up a system. Uh, and this system aims at um, maintaining 
gender domination. So they are different in nature, in, um, in severity also, um, but they do have a social role, mm -hmm. a social function that is uh, to maintain a sexist order or gender order. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, how, uh, in your opinion, the pandemic, the COVID pandemic uh, affected the, the situation of women and affected uh, this violence? Mm. Um, actually, we, we did a, an investigation on, on domestic violence during the COVID um, epidemic with uh, several colleagues and, and uh, one of them was Marion Tius. And what we show uh, was what, that um, domestic violence was, um, the, the pandemic actually had a, a sort of double effect according to each personal situation. Um, for instance, for women who were um, trapped with their abusers, it may have increased violence. But for some women who were um, separate from their, who were divorced, for instance, for, from their abusive partner, and who still experience violence on a daily basis due to uh, children custody or issues of, well, different issues such as children custody, um, it actually had the effect of protecting them uh, because during uh, the pandemic, um, abusive partners couldn't get to them um, and, could, and it had the effect of stopping um, harassment. So, um, we talked about uh, the, the pandemic as a protective bubble for these women. So those women who were divorced uh, from their abusive partners, but it, it had also the effect of increasing the tension and conflict and violence um, at home for some others. Mm -hmm. And also another effect of the pandemic was to lower the number of femicides in France. Mm -hmm. Because one of the reasons uh, a feminicide is, is committed is, is that um, there is like abuse and everything, but also when a woman leaves, when a survivor leaves uh, her abusive partner, it has the effect of increasing the risk of femicide. Of femicide. So, um, well, you see, there were ambivalent uh, effects of, of, mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. pandemic. Yes, I think it was the same uh, in Poland. I'm not a specialist in this uh, subject, but uh, unfortunately, I think it was the same. And, and uh, I am worried about uh, the situation of women in, in Poland. And I am sure that Aneta will be OK. Uh, Poland, the situation in Eastern Europe, the, the situation is very, very different and uh, from very different uh, reasons. And um, I saw the um, last uh, report, Eurobarom, and in Poland, on the situation for me it was quite shocked and um, uh, think what to because for me the conclusion is that uh, uh, still in Poland the problem is the lack of social awareness and also about very strong patriarchal social culture and also because we live in the very catholic uh, uh, society. So uh, what do you think how we could change this situation? I'm sorry, but I uh, could you repeat the question because the line is very bad. And you ah, yes, 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 we have some technical, 
Yes, so we have some technical uh, problems. So uh, I will repeat. Uh, Please, thanks. Uh, now, uh, Kingo, ja nie słyszę. Catholic country. Pauli, did you did you hear what was said? Uh, no, not really. No, me too. Yes, I think I have some problem with internet connection. Do you hear me? Now, yeah. 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 Now, now it's okay. Okay. So uh, uh, for me in Poland is still the problem the, of the lack of the social awareness about the about the, this problem about the situation of women. Women are discriminated, shamed, and responsibility for action is shifted. Uh, so what? Do you think how is the uh, solution to change the, the situation in uh, Poland? Well, yes, I have a, a very bad connection. It's okay, I, I did hear you. Um, I don't know if you can hear me, Kinga. Yeah, okay. Yes. Thanks. Um, I, I'm I'm sorry, but I couldn't answer because I don't know the the police mm -hmm. police context. What mm -hmm. I know is that, um, and it's from uh, it's drawn from um, a study uh, directed by um, Laurel Weldon, who's an American politist, and she shows that um, what actually helps. Um, uh, what she calls um, state reactivity is the fact that women's movements are um, active in mm -hmm. in a country. So because she compared different countries around the world, like 60 or 100, I can remember, but several countries around the world. And she showed that one of the main factors that influence state reactivity and state intervention is um, women's movement. So I would say that, but I have no idea because I I, I, I can't mm -hmm. tell about mm -hmm. the Polish uh, context. I'm I'm pretty sure you you know more more than I can. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Is there is some another questions or comments? Yes, we have one question from Arda Gokce on the chat. Can only laws and education and prevent violence against women? Uh, what about culture? If a culture has tendency to violence, is it possible to eradicate it completely? Um, I don't know if any culture has a tendency towards violence uh, compared to another culture. Uh, violence is, is in every culture. Um, what I know is that actually when women's movements call for state intervention, call for um, measures to deal with violence and more specifically to deal with uh, violence against women, in domestic violence, then um, it does change uh, the way people and society perceive of violence. Um, but still, even when we have state intervention and you know in the national text reports and measures, uh, violence against women still exists. So I wouldn't say that there are uh, cultures um, that avoid violence or that there are cultures that, that are more that have a greater tendency towards violence because violence against women is um, exists in in every culture uh, but i suppose that women's movements and state interventions are, are, are major factors to prevent violence um yeah
Thank you very much. So uh, I think if there is no question, I think we will stop here. Excuse me. Uh, so I yes. have a question. Yes, yes, please. Do you think that uh, men are still the dominant political force in the Western world? So to say. I do think that gender inequalities um, are, are still a dominant force in the Western world, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, still that gender inequality still exists. Inequality, sorry. And this is one of the major reasons why violence against women still exists in, in the Western world. Um, so yes, I mean, um, it's, uh, it's different from, and, and um, the gender order has changed uh, due to the femini feminization of work, uh, due to uh, the diffusion of an idea of uh, equality, gender equality, but gender inequalities do exist um, at work and at home and in different sectors of society, like the political sector, the judicial sector and everything. So I would say that, well, at least gender inequalities do exist, yeah. And I don't know if, if it doesn't, so yeah. And what do you think is the um, area uh, that where, where gender inequalities exist in the Western world in the law? Is there such an area or is it just social? Uh, so social uh, dynamics and not the law, not discrimination in law. I have to say it is difficult to speak about the Western world because it's 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 a very heterogeneous world. Um, but I could say that in France we are in a sort of ambivalent uh, context where law, uh, the law. Um, trying to prevent inequalities um, and um, equal gender equality is a is um, a, so, a social is, is 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 starting to to become a social norm but um, it doesn't um, but gender inequality still exists. So I think there's kind of a paradoxical context where laws and norms are uh, promoting uh, gender equality and are fighting against discriminations, but still gender inequalities exist. Mm, yes, I think that mm, right now in the law, there is there is uh, no laws that discriminate against women specifically, like, for example, that women can vote or women can do this. Exactly, yeah. But yeah, in, but, yeah, in but still, opinion, what, okay, sorry, okay. sorry, sorry. Okay, uh, speak. You, you can say, uh, you can finish uh, your, okay, thank what you. you wanted to say. Sorry, since I, I, I can't see you, so I, I don't know if you're going to speak or not, but, um, uh, yeah, what I was saying was that uh, you're right in saying that um, you have like legal norms that that are against uh, that are well gender neutral and uh, that are not uh, promoting gender inequalities that uh, do not rely on on gender inequalities. But still, when these laws are implemented, um, there is a gender inequalities still prevail. Um, it's a difference between formal. Um, uh, I can I, I can find my words, and especially I can't find them in in French, so it's difficult to find them in English. But you have a difference between um, uh, laws, measures, and how these laws and measures are implemented, and also how um, when you look at the practical practices and social practices and social representations, they do rely and reproduce uh, gender inequalities. So I don't know if you see what I mean, but you have laws and measures 
and um, uh, social discourse, and then you have how they are implemented, and then you have uh, social practices and representation that still reproduce inequalities. Mm, yes, I. In my opinion, uh, there is uh, there are still laws that do discriminate based on gender, but mm -hmm. at least in Poland, the country where mm -hmm. I live, but they discriminate against men specifically. For example, conscription. Just men have to go and women only those with medical education or the retirement age is higher for men uh, in, by five years. And it's specifically written in the law for men. But I agree that uh, in, society, in the society, there is still discrimination against women, but not in the law, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. In the law, there, but there, in the law, there is still obvious discrimination against men. And it's, I think, an overlooked problem. Well, I don't know about the Polish context and the Polish case. I wouldn't say that there are discriminations against men because, um, um, well, it's a way, it's also a way of excluding women from, from social spheres. I don't, uh, by saying that, I wouldn't say that um, um, gender equalities will be achieved once women will have access to the military or to um, the con conscription. But also this kind of what you call gender discrimination is actual uh, against men are uh, also means of excluding women from some social and political spheres. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I saw that Aneta has uh, another question or comments. No? Okay, so uh, uh, do you have uh, some remarks or questions? If not, uh, I think we will stop here. So uh, thank you very much, Pauline Delage, uh, for your very, very interesting uh, intervention. And um, I invite you to our next seminar during uh, the second semester, 21st of February, Sami Ramdani uh, will present evolution of gas infrastructure in the Baltic Sea in 2022. So thank you uh, very much. And we will see during the next semester. So thank you and goodbye. Thank, thank you. you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.